Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I'm doing this video early and I do have some people that are asleep. I could get in trouble. This is highly risky. We're going to do it anyway because we've got an XRP alert. The lowest RSI in the history of XRP it says um, the RSI curvature is turning upwards and we have a long road of Ahead of seven, head to seventy, and even above eighty. XRP army stays steady. We have the lowest RSI in the history of XRP, and I have no idea what an RSI is, but it must be a big deal. Then we've got XRP on the monthly time frame will be cl uh, close, to, uh, whatever that is. Prices between Fibonacci levels and ascending support, descending resistance. Unleash the Dragon XRP. And folks, if you think that those charts, if you do know charts and you know what in the crap they were talking about there, you'll find this even more interesting. This Kenny Nugent guy, Sean, I will not put you in a tough situation since you're no longer a director at Ripple. In your opinion, what you, what do you think about XRP in the in the future? I understand you no longer work for Ripple. Be honest, I ask on behalf of my followers. Sean McBride, who used to be at Ripple. There are way too many aspects to consider currently, most importantly, the SEC case. I do think there are a number of extremely positive factors working in favor of the entire industry. Fit 21, Saab 121, Dead Box, Judgment. And knowing what I know about Ripple versus SEC case, I'm almost positive we will see a very favorable outcome in addition, we all know Ripple has a lock on B2B payments. They're focused on their customers and increasing their product suite, tokenization, custody, stablecoin, etc., and have relationships with major institutions. All things considered, XRP is primed for a breakout the likes of which we've probably never seen before, just my opinion. That right there captures my sentiment completely. All things considered, XRP is primed for a breakout, the likes of which we've never, probably never seen before. Why am I getting texts this early in the morning? Let's see. Um, don't know. All right. Okay, moving along. Okay, as you know, Consensus 2024 was yesterday. I've got several clips queued up. Here's a good one. Stuff better than the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Isn't crypto going to kick the traditional market's ass over time and all stock trading is going to move to digital assets markets? Um, sorry to ask myself a question, but it's an extension of that. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll stop rambling in a second. But look, there, that is not going to happen for a long time. A long, long, I would love it if it did. Like I've devoted my whole life to digital assets. If that happened overnight, uh, this would go from being, you know, a relatively small industry to, to a gigantic industry. The issue is there still aren't trusted layer ones, which can, which can actually be the ledger themselves, which can actually be the settlement mechanism themselves, which can actually be the data repository themselves. Why? I know you're sitting there going, what the hell is he talking about? This is a digital assets conference. There's Solana, there's Cardano, there's Ethereum, the da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I mean trusted by regulators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is your flip the switch moment, folks. Then this guy's talking about Bitcoin, but while he's talking, I'm thinking about XRP. I can't buy any more watches, villas, airplanes, homes. Like, I'm getting rid of stuff. And then going, oh, let me take that and put it in Bitcoin. Now is the time to buy Bitcoin. If it can go to the 1 million, it can go to 10 billion. Finite is finite, which means the price could go infinite and it should go infinite. At least according to entrepreneur and investor Gary Cardone. We haven't even seen come to the table yet. It's not even shown up. I mean, I just went through metrics with Bitwise. It's freaking staggering. I've been doing this my whole life. Freaking staggering. I have never seen data like this. 
this. The conversation in this interview gets real. What's your number one piece of advice to go from $1,000 to a million dollars? So smash the like button. This is the perfect video to send to somebody who truly wants to understand the bull case for Bitcoin. Now, let me introduce... I may have to watch that full video later. Look at John Deaton. He steps away from the U.S. Capitol. He signed a pledge to pass legislation that amends the Constitution and places term limits on members of Congress. Well, that right there by itself would solve so many problems, folks. Then we've got this from, this is Roger Veer. He was one of the, he was one of the first funders of Ripple, is what he told me in Singapore. What's he talking about here, U.S. intelligence agencies? Maybe a lot of people don't know, is that a man openly claiming to work for a U.S. intelligence agency, literally paid David uh, Peter Todd to produce small block propaganda and to in introduce this thing called replace by fee, which makes Bitcoin far less useful for payment. So literally a guy claiming to work for U.S. intelligence agencies was there undermining Bitcoin's usefulness as cash from you know the earliest days of Bitcoin. And that's covered right there uh, in the book. It's not even disputed. There's all the citations right there, like uh, for the whole world to see, for anybody that's actually paying attention. It's like, ask yourself, why would U.S. intelligence agencies want Bitcoin to be, would they want it to be more useful or less useful, right? Like it undermines the U.S. dollar. Of course, they want to do everything they can to make it less useful and more, less valuable to the world. And the best way they were able to come up with to do that was to trick people into thinking that, oh, let's make the transaction slow, expensive, and unreliable and force everybody to use these custodial platforms. But we'll still call the platforms wallets, even though they're not. Like uh, Wallet of Satoshi and Strike and Shield, none of them are wallets. They're all custodial accounts where the government can freeze your money at any time. Or maybe they don't even have your money. Maybe they're already engaged in fractional reserve Bitcoining. We don't know. Uh, and so it's really uh, really been disappointing to see how many people have uh, drank the Kool-Aid and been fooled by it. See, no, this is what would really make sense. I've talked a lot on this channel about how so many of these pundits are literally working for someone. It's like they're all told, okay, now you now talk about Q Solana. Now all talk about Solana. And then all in conjunction with each other, they start talking about Solana. Well, they've been doing the, the same thing with Bitcoin and Ethereum from inception. So you have to wonder if these, these, these main pundits, and these pundits won't ever, ever acknowledge that we even exist out here because if they did, they might have to debate the point. They can't do that because I've always thought that there's many of them. In fact, most of the crypto, most of the people in crypto that can't talk about anything except Bitcoin, I think that I've always felt like most of them are being paid in order to carry this, this, just pound this same narrative over your head. Bitcoin, theory, now Solana. No question. Notice he mentioned the strike wallet. If there's anybody who was, is a part of a marketing program, it's that Jack Mauler's guy with his the young guy with the hoodie. Okay. Patrick McHenry announces Digital Assets Financial Technology and Inclusion Subcommittee hearing entitled Next Generation Infrastructure, How Tokenization of Real World Assets Will Facilitate Efficient Markets. Um, that's good stuff. And then this is, I believe this is J.P. Morgan's uh, guy, I don't, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name. But here he is at consensus bragging about how far along J.P. Morgan is. You mean the same, same J.P. Morgan that was involved with consensus? Thanks has been around almost a... Not consensus, the, uh, the conference. Consensus, the Joseph Lubin consensus. And so it might be the longest lasting uh, blockchain business at any financial institution. And we went from what used to be a couple of people actually literally 10 years ago to now about 300 people who do this full time. So we also have one of the biggest and probably one of the most experienced teams. And our focus has really been you know, really getting inspired by, frankly, places like Consensus, like this conference and the folks who are here. So get inspired by Web3 and see if we can bring some of those ideas, and many of those are great ideas, like 24-7, instant settlement, immutability, um, you know, programmability and composability. How do we bring that into regulated financial institutions? And so we've been on a journey for many, many years um, in our business unit at JP Morgan, and now I think our focus increasingly is tending towards tokenization and money. So we are also, frankly, I think one of the very few banks, if not the only one, that has 
the scale of payments that happen on a blockchain anywhere in the world. So more recently, we've been starting to do uh, you know more and more synchronized payments with others because many other chains, especially the ones that are permissioned, uh, really lack money. So they have tokenized assets, they don't have a payment vehicle. So we are now providing them through our synchronized payments capabilities, JPM coin as a solution. Similarly, we just- Why, why isn't JPM coin a security? Why is Gary Gensler never gone after that? To a muni bond on our chain for the first time, which is also, you know, a step towards using it more broadly. So the cool thing Where's about- the JP Morgan lawsuit from the SEC that ties them up for three years? Blockchains, as you obviously are very well aware, is that everything can be represented in one infrastructure. So we can do money, we can do assets, we can do you know delivery versus payment, we can post those assets, etc. So it's been a very exciting time for us over the last year. Okay, and now um, I'm going to go into the group. We're going to look. There's a lot of drama going on right here, folks. I'm about to show you some of that drama, and I can't talk about it out here, but. This thing, let me tell you what, and I'll, I mean, I'll give you the gist of it. This, this whole Stephen Naryoff thing with, with Boring Sleuth, um, he's, he's cracking open a lot of stuff, and I'm not saying what's true and what's not true right now, but what I, what I will tell you is, if I know anything about the XRP Army, the XRP Army, as long as you're on the right side, can be the greatest thing you have. But the XRP army is a double-edged sword, and the second that you are, are found to be anything other than straightforward and, and what you see is what you get, watch out, because this thing can turn like a, it can turn on a dime. And it, we're still waiting on Stephen to hear his side of the story, and that's kind of where I'm leaving it. But I'm going to talk a little more about that in the in the group. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family. There's a lot of drama going on. Let's talk about some of it. Here we go.